Hi friends, host Eric here, host of Talking with Famous People, and this is going to be the first in a couple of videos that I make using documents, either from my book or that I'm currently making to go over things, and the reason I'm doing this is multiple. For one thing, most importantly, I've been doing some critiquing of some other people's models and stuff, and I haven't really, of late anyway, presented a, a clear presentation of my own understanding of things so let's begin with this so I think the best way to begin any conversation about cognitive functions is, is to begin by discussing psycho frames in psychology psychology works in a few different ways like I mean what it attempts to do or be is a lot of different things and I'm talking mostly here I'm just talking really about the research aspect of it not so much the um, the therapy aspect of it, which is a whole separate block of psych frames, but if we talk talk about psychology research, it functions either as descriptions of individuals in which it attributes to people attributes, things like Big Five do this, and says, okay, people have conscientiousness, people have extroversion, people have these attributes, and we can measure them not in not against a an empirical uh, absolute, but rather in relation to other people. So you're conscientious if you're more conscientious than others. This is a fine enough thing to do, there's nothing wrong with it, but um, it doesn't really tell us very much meaningful about what human cognition is, how it manifests, what, what we as beings are, or any of the basic philosophical questions. You can also use a psych frame that says behaviors against norms, and that's mostly going to be manifestations of pathology. So that's like, well, you're more hyper than most people, so you're ADHD or something like that. That's a behavior against a norm. If you're if you're measuring, like, okay, well, what are you actually doing? How are you acting? How does that inhibit your capacity to function in society in keeping with the norms of society? There's a third frame which is quite popular, which is developmental benchmarks. It says it basically looks at psychology as an expression of nurture impacts. So how how healthy you are depends basically on how well loved you were. Another kind of approach are mechanistic descriptions of the human, and you might say that cognitive functions falls into this category, but I really would say it doesn't because what I'm talking about here are drive based. Uh, psych models, things that say, you know, people are driven to attain authenticity, like Alex Wood has a study about this or something. I, I don't remember the exact study because I just, I wrote down, I had those pages open for a while, but I just decided, whatever. Consistency, like, a consistency-based drive would be, a cognitive dissonance theory is, is suggesting basically that people are driven by consistency. Belonging-based drive, Maslow and others talk about that. Teleology, is basically saying your drive is to accomplish goals and it's a behaviorist approach or frame for psychology and Skinner's and others would do that and then there's drive theory as a whole and one thing I thought was interesting is the this audience test that they've done where they show how for simple tasks that you know how to do well people perform better with an audience for complicated tasks that you don't know how to do well, or you know, for tasks that you don't, you don't have a lot of prep on or something, that you do less well in front of an audience, as a general rule. Well, this is one of the risks of talking about attributes, right? It's not the case for any users, any DOMs anyway. It is the case probably for everybody else. And so if you look at the stats or something, it's going to look like a general a general attribute that people mostly have or something, but it's not that. It's it's an expression of functions. How will you perform in, an, in a situation that requires improvisation is going to, especially with some sort of verbal improvisation, is going to uh, depend almost entirely on your extroverted intuition. If you're an ISTP, you're going to fail utterly in that situation. And if you're an ENTP, you're probably going to thrive. So let's look at another possible frame is cycle philosophy analyses basically oh, I want to get I'll do this last this last free energy minimization what is X as it expresses in human behavior actually so like 
Okay, well, what actually is authenticity? That's another question that psychology might ask and try to explain it in terms of, of either brain activity or brain chemistry or some other empirics like that, right? And then there's linguistics. How much of our cognition is actually determined entirely by the language we use? Well, linguistics would say all of it, functionally. So, I mean, not really all of it, but m almost all of it. And I, I tend towards the linguistics side of, of things in general. This free energy minimization is an interesting notion by um, somebody who's about to be some sort of super genius or something. Uh, basically, he says that the fundamental drive that underlies all human and all endeavor by all life is the minimization of free energy, which can sort of be explained as minimizing surprise. Um, it's the only singular drive that can explain, that can sort of underlie all behavior or something that this guy just claimed. Then he talks about basically frames of reference and how, what I talk about a lot, but, um, he, I don't know, for some reason the way he talks about it, I guess, has captured people's imagination a bit. But anyway, uh. So, well, I guess he's got, like, you know, he's probably has letters after his name and stuff, too. Taxonomy of attentional manners. So, this is what we're actually talking about, though, in general, when we're talking about cognitive functions, is a taxonomy of attentional manners, and it's an observer-first taxonomy. And so, the next question is, does it set, subsume all these other things? I would claim that, yes, it does subsume them. And what does that mean? It means <coughs> all these other things can be explained as expressions of individuals, observers, and their own attentional habits. So the reason this guy is so focused on this links to his own attentional habits. And this understanding of the world, that, that humanity is an expression of a drive towards authenticity, is an understanding of the world that's an expression of Alex Wood, who is probably, you know, an INFP or something. And so he, he's trying to to use science, quote unquote, to convey his understanding of the world, unaware that he's frame locked in his own frame because he doesn't have a meta frame like this to subsume his own shit. So I understand my own stuff within this meta frame. I, I realize that this video and is is an expression of me, of my own ontology and teleology. And my own purposes are whatever they are. There are varying degrees of purpose, right? Some of them are more, some actions are more purpose and intentional than others and, and are more decided than others. So here's some reasons why I think this taxonomy of intentional manners is better than these, any of these other approaches. First of all, it recognizes that everything I do and say is, is an expression of my human experience and that while we talk about things as being external and things can be external and objectively accessible by third parties as all of this data and this information is um, that doesn't stop it from being an expression of my own illocutionary frame on a fundamental level and one of the things that the commenter said the other day uh, I forget his name now but um, somebody I mentioned a lot or talked about a lot in the DSP critics video what was his name I don't remember. I'm not remembering it at the moment. But regardless, he said, he, you know, he said something about uh, I that all actions were fundamentally selfish, that I, I was saying that. And I, I did say something like that, but what I mean to say is all actions somehow fundamentally serve the self, which is actually what I think I said, which does not mean they're selfish. It means that I might be very selfless, but in doing so, I'm I'm garnering selflessness as part of my ontology and I might think that's a good thing or believe it to be the righteous thing or something like that and then in so doing I'm I'm supporting and maintaining that ontological process or consideration in my identity so there is a illocutionary frame to everything everybody's got a purpose for doing things and when we when we try so hard as as sciencey sounding stuff to extract the individual from the equation to extract the observer from the equation 
we reduce its link to reality, basically. So, its description of my human experience makes me more powerful in deconstructing yours and my own, right? Than you are if you don't have the metaframe. It's the most frame aware of all the possible psychological frames that you can employ. In other words, it's its whole point, as far as I'm concerned, is to never be caught unaware of your frame. Most reality consistent, that's how reality actually works, is these people are all just expressing their own frame biases and are unaware of it. E equalizes marginalized manners of being. That is to say, when we recognize that the, this logical explication of things that's TI sound and TI validated is is that but it, that it's got not necessarily going to win on other metrics that because of what it, it is attempting to be then we just need to look and see if the context is appropriate is this an appropriate situation to be using that metric instead of the others recognizing that no metric has absolute primacy and also recognizing that some metrics are appropriate for some circumstances and inappropriate for others. These are the sort of things that happen when you have the meta frame in place that don't happen if you don't have it in place. Contextualizes all manners of beings and recognizes their excesses. So we can, we when you realize that your logic, for example, is an expression of your being rather than a universal truth that everybody else needs to agree with, then you realize, oh, I'm, I'm hammering everybody with this because I think it's the only way to be or something. But it's not the only way to be, and it's not the only metric to use, and it's not necessarily a good metric to use in every situation. And even if it is a good metric to use in a given situation, that doesn't mean that I ought not pad it with some FE, for example. And recognizing all these things is necessitated by, almost. Like, understanding them prevents you from not utilizing that knowledge. It, it it's exclusive of that in some way. Okay, so uh, requires that your perspective acknowledge the illocutionary aspects as well if it wishes to not be subsumed, to argue its position within a field of alternative equivalence and renders a person able to manage all those psycho psychology schools in one frame. In other words, right, this one frame, this one meta frame explains all of these things, but they explain them as as manifestations of the people who make them and say them. So, as long as we keep focused on the individual foremost and the observer foremost, we aren't going to run afoul of reality. Philosophy. Nature of reality, expression of conscious being. So, um, these are some philosophy things that I think it's important to sort of have in place as observations before making any further case about cognitive function. The nature of reality is that it's an expression of conscious being. There is no reality that we can imagine or think of or experience or be or anything that's not an expression of a single conscious being. And as far as it's communicable, it's almost certainly an expression of a single conscious um, being that is persistent across time in a way that's made possible by the language. So, time space, there's no, observation equals instantiation equals existentiality. In other words, there's never an instance of a thing not in a frame. You can't observe something without observing it within a frame and instantiating it and thereby rendering it existential. Time, space, light, and energy are expressions of conscious being like everything else knowable, experienceable, or communicable. So this is, we, we think about time, space, and light, and energy as being these external things, but time is individuated. Space is only relevant as via an observer's perspective on it. Light is... I mean, the thing is, it's hard to understand any of, of these physical things as being expressions of a given individual's ontology, but they are. And the reason is because they couldn't, it's not possible for them to not be their existence supervenes upon observation like everything else. The dimension of physical reference is necessarily resultant from sentient agents manifesting on the physical plane. One aspect of being is experiential. It happens in the now, and it is not made of meaning, though we cannot talk about it without first making meaning from experience. So, one aspect of being is experiential, which means it's real time, it's happening now. So, it links in time to the now. The experiential makes life weighty. 
That's where FI lies. SI, your memory's good and bad that you carry with you and weight you down and cause you to feel things. That's all experiential or residue or artifacts of experience. The dimension of representational representational reference is necessarily resultant from sentient agents manifesting identity that persists across time. Identity persistence comes from language. Um, now, note that being persistence doesn't so like my cat knows who i am and knows that somebody else isn't me and stuff like that even though it doesn't have language right but the cat doesn't really have probably self-concept so i guess that's maybe a better thing to differentiate there the representational makes life significant whereas the experiential makes life weighty uh it's there's a difference there significant means worthy of further attention weighty means demanding of further attention the architecture so what's the architecture of my understanding of cognitive functions is there are two aspects or ecosystems of reality physical and metaphysical or real time and turn based quote unquote there are four manners of being sentient in, and four manners of being sentient are needed to function fully as an agent in either ecosystem knowing judging acting interacting um, two approaches to each manner reflect one manner native to each ecosystem. SI equals experiential knowing, NI equals representational knowing. FI equals experiential judging, TI equals representational judging. TE equals experiential interface, FE equals representational interface. SE equals experiential action, N equals representational action. Each person, person being extant in both real time and as a persistent identity it means each person has three functions native to one ecosystem and one function native to the other. The reason for this is the way that the action and knowing functions link on the axes. The action function of one ecosystem links to the knowing function of the other ecosystem. And because you can't, you have to have some sort of way to, to go between the two, right? You can't be a fully experiential being and be fully human. Nor can you be a fully metaphysical being and be fully human. Um, if I could be a fully metaphysical being and be fully human, then humans would be able to be identical copies of themselves. It wouldn't be a particularist element. It would be like a digital file. But I can't be purely metaphysical because there's always a physical component of it that links to the incommunicable aspects of things. Humans will never be able to transfer their consciousness onto computers. It doesn't make any sense. Because they're not human anymore. They don't have the experiential aspect of things. They just have the metaphysical aspect of things and that renders them just a digital file that can be copied. So it's not human then anymore uh, three kinds of agent in an environment behavior comprises comprise the four functions so three kinds of agent in an environment behavior and what kinds of, of behaviors are there there's put get and receive however there's also a fourth one under which I put here which is not really any of these three kinds which is interface and it prioritizes responsivity external fluidity over metrics that it assume non-fluid so it's like it interface functions say i'm going to interface with the world either like kimberly does if i run into a problem i'm going to think how who do i get to solve this problem and if you interface in that way then you've got to be very responsive to the person you're dealing with and under reading them and understanding them and help moving them to doing what you need them to do if you use TE as an interface function, you need to be very responsive to the actual thing in front of you. If I'm fixing the doorknob and I notice something, it, I have to look carefully and notice everything and try to figure out how to fix it. Or when I was trying to make the cricket work properly for Kimberly, I had to do some trial and error and figure out how to fix it, you know, or figure out how to make it work. That's TE. I don't, I didn't look first FE to think, okay, well, who can, who can Kimberly and I call to who can help us with this? I thought TE first because it's six slot and it's reasonably strong and it's, it's, it's more of a tool like function for me than FE is, which is more of an absolute value. <coughs> so these interface functions, TE and FE, they use put, get, and receive in a, in a, um, turn based real time hybrid responsivity web thing okay but there there's really only three kinds of action or three kinds of behavior put information get receive you think about computers uh it works the same way it's like you're either putting information someplace like in a form you're getting information just by like reading something or like you're doing now or you're receiving information that you didn't actively get right now these these are are rough rough metaphors because really your receive function is a knowing function and which means basically you understand things as 
this way or that way before you do any deliberation on them, which would be the judging functions. And you use that knowledge to take, um, to interface. So you need to interface your, 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 uh, I mean, I'm sorry, to act. I don't want to get bogged down. Let me finish this last bit and then I'm going to end it after six. I'm only going one through six here. Mechanics are implicit to realities regarding the nature of attention itself. To attend to one thing, this is the mechanics of functions, to attend to one thing and in one way is to not concurrently attend to another thing and in an exclusive way, and, and in a way exclusive of the first. So, um, in, in a way exclusive of the first. This is both self-evident and definitionally necessary. Pay attention to X equals ignore not X if attending to not X will prevent or preclude attending to X. Note, intentionality refers to direction and willfulness refers to impetus. The program function is intentionality framing and has its own impetus. The tool function is both intentional and willful. The tertiary function is willful but only sometimes intentional. The seeking function is willful but only sort of intentional. The ignoring function is unintentional and reflexive because you don't need to. The countervalued function is willful but unintentional. The polar function is reflexive and unintentional because you can't. The balanced function is reflexive but intentional. So as this is my, this is rough a little bit, um, but this is a another way of, of looking at how the the mechanics of the functions work. There's a number of different ways of looking at that. And that's what I go into next here, which says we can understand functions then through a variety of frames. Values, kinds of actions, attributes, archetypes, models of cognitive mechanics, taxonomy of attentional preferences or habits, etc. And that's going to bring us to basic definitions of each function, which are therefore a challenge, because such definitions include or prioritize one function frame to the exclusion of others. Now, I do, I'm going to read this one example definition, which is for any. I haven't finished the definitions yet, but at this point, I'm starting to think maybe I should just go back to my book and start making videos from that. So, um, any, a manner of being in which an individual's attention is directed towards the generation of new words, ideas, and meanings. Number one, habitual use of this function at the expense of others correlates with valuing novelty, creativity, and expression. In other words, if this is your program function, you're going to value these things for sure. Because it is a manner of action, any is always paired with the judging function, TI or FI, when any works as the program function, which balances will and intentionality as expressed up here, right? Number three, paired on its axis is SI, or experiential knowing. Number four, native to the representational ecosystem where conditionality allows it to act freely without the constraints of linear time. That is, a real time. Or physical world stuff. So, look. I... I regret and lament the fact that this is somewhat complicated. And so is why I'm making a couple of, uh, like a, I'm going to make a series of these littler videos where I cover chunks of ideas, I guess. But um, it, the, the important things to remember are pretty straightforward and simple. That no matter what you think, say, whatever, no matter how objective, reasonable, logical, whatever it is you, you think you are or are actually, you're words behavior are still fundamentally an expression of you and they are not first and foremost the locutionary meaning of the words the idea that exists outside of all of us somehow those words are not first and foremost that they are first and foremost an expression of who you are a particularist being that can never be um anything but wholly unique in some sense because of their particularist half but at the same time, will always be an expression of some pattern because of their metaphysical half. So the, the thing is, we run afoul of lots of apparent paradoxes and contradictions, problems, disputes, whatever, when we don't have a meta frame. And everybody walks around presuming their own frame is their frame because it's the best, not because it's, their, it's a reflection of their attentional habits. That's what, to me, cognitive function offers humanity, is a meta frame of of being self-aware that your frame is your reflexive habit not not a revelation of how how much more more correct you are than everybody else about everything right it, it may be true that some sets of words within certain frames will resonate as more useful and true in everything but even if that's the case 
That just means you're doing a good job of being yourself. It doesn't mean that you're... The reason you're right is because of... It's a complex... It's hard to explain. But wait, if, can I ask you this? Like, I've often asked... Uh, or, or try to describe people or try to help people uh, understand that we're given a set of like we're the circle and then there's pies and so your attentional m matter or whatever you get like pie shapes and so when you some people think more in this area like you know what I'm saying like um, if you were to use pie shapes it doesn't mean that you have more of this it just means you have less of that right in other words you kind of get a slice of the pie. And you're naturally going to think that you've got the best slice of pie. Okay, The reason you picked that slice of pie is because that's the best piece, obviously. But the reality is you didn't pick that slice of pie. You are that slice of pie. <laughs> and the other slices of the pie may be different kinds of pie, like boysenberry or, or strawberry or something. That doesn't mean that lemon meringue pie is best because you're a lemon meringue pie. Okay, that's basically the gist of it. So, um, that's it for this video. That's uh, 26 we minutes. Have cheesecake. Cheesecake, right. Don't forget to eat plenty of cheesecake.